Welcome to the Coffee Pod mini series of podcasts. This is the AI for Science and Government edition. In here, we want to focus on the people behind the projects and get to know them and their story. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Coffee Pod um, ASG edition. I'm very happy to introduce uh, today's guest. I'm here with Malvika Sharon. Hi. Hello, hello. You're a senior researcher, right? Yeah, I'm a senior researcher for the Tools, Practices and System, and I focus on open research and community building. That's awesome. And before we get to know all about that, I need to start with our first question, which is, how do you take your coffee? Oh, just black. Ah, you're just one black. of my girls, yeah. We have a machine at home now, so I have a machine who follows my command. Yes, that is amazing. How caffeinated are you then on a day-to-day basis now? Not too much, <laughs> not too much. Just a cup in the morning, and if I'm sleeping by 5 p.m., I need one. Yeah, that's fair enough, but at least we have a guest that does take coffee. We've had a, <laughs> a lot of guests that took coffee without coffee, so tea. <laughs> <laughs> so um, tell us a little bit about your um, career up until now. How did you come to be a senior researcher for TPS. Oh, flashback. (laughs) I was in school in India, in my hometown in Ranchi, and I heard the word nanotechnology. Fascinating. I heard that people are looking for microbes in the space. Yes. And I was very fascinated. And uh, I kind of thought that that sounds like a great profession. So I decided I want to be a nanotechnologist. Finished my sort of higher secondary, moved to south of India to study biotechnology and dissected a lot of animals that I shouldn't anymore. Um, And then I moved to Germany to do my master's in bioinformatics. I was, for the last year in India, I was uh, doing a job as an educational consultant where I was um, kind of guiding students to learn about what they want to study, where they want to go. And in that process, I kind of convinced myself that I should go to Germany. Um, And uh, I did my master's, didn't think I learned enough. uh, So I really needed to do PhD so I can really, you know, immerse myself in bioinformatics, everything. So I did my PhD also in Germany. And during my PhD, I had a chance to go to UNESCO to talk about open science um, uh, from a graduate student perspective. And I was sitting with policymakers and government and different students, and I loved it so much. And I said, this is what I want to do. And that was a pure switch, um, like while I was doing my PhD to understand what community building looks like, you know, how to kind of work uh, at the grassroots level. When I finished my PhD, while I was finishing my PhD, I... um, I got in touch with a friend of mine, Aiden Budd, who was a community manager at the time and a great mentor to me. And uh, he was working in European Molecular Biology Laboratory, where when he was leaving, he asked me to apply for his position, which was very surprising. But I did and I got through and I worked there, met Kirsty because I applied for a fellowship in Software Sustainability Institute and uh, came down to Turing talk to her about my work and she offered me a job. (laughs) So the next thing I knew, I was moving to London to work on the Turing Way, a project that I still work on. That's my whole summary of career. (laughs) Oh my gosh, that's amazing. I have so many questions. I don't know. (laughs) Um, Because this is amazing because you had such a, a different path from what you expected to have when you were younger because you don't work now with biotechnology or nanotechnology. No. Um, so, so what do you think your younger self would say? Oh, my younger self would be like, oh, you're living in London. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I, I, I kind of have now my story very much figured out what my career is, but it, it is obviously very wiggly. It didn't really start where it needed to. It didn't really end where it needed to. I don't think it has ended anyway. I feel like um, bioinformatics nanotechnology somewhat still related and suddenly being introduced to community where people were doing work and just knowing that I can enable the work that they are doing was yeah. so much more satisfying to me. I kind of came to this realization is that 
uh, there are so many people who are much better coder than me, much better at, you know, understanding bioinformatics and biomolecules and whatever nano level mo molecules. And I'm really good at community building. So I need to really choose the path that does the job in a better sense. So yeah, I'm not doing what I thought I will, but I feel, I hope that my work is enabling that somewhere. So what would you tell your younger self? Oh yeah, self? that's a question that I didn't answer. Um, sorry to disappoint you, <laughs> but I'm very happy. <laughs> I think she would be very happy that you're happy more than, uh, than the fact that you're... Do you have any advice for someone that would have the same path as you and that might discover this? Yeah, I, I really think that we... I think it's a bit... Maybe you'll have to cut it out, but um, I think growing up in a country where there are a lot of hierarchy, where you're a student and you need to suppose, supposed to learn in a certain way, you can't challenge your teacher. Um, leaving India and coming to a new university where I was actually told the first thing that you need to challenge your teacher was such an such a new realization. Like I could imagine bigger, I can think bigger. And I think if I have to go back and talk to that little child, I would say think bigger. There's a lot more you don't know, your teachers do not know. Everyone's learning all the time. I think that freedom to think and dream big is not there for most people. And I would love for little girls all around the world to dream big. Oh, this is amazing. I'm a, I'm a little bit like a, in all of what you just said. That's a really good uh, message. Um, but I'm I'm sure your younger self would be super proud of who you are and where you are. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and a little bit of, of dirt, if you might ask me, what was it like coming to Europe? How did you find it? I was, I, uh, I actually admired the person who just packed her bag and came to Germany to study computer science, bioinformatics without a computer. Or a book. <laughs> like, I really don't know what I was thinking. Um, I kind of didn't get too surprised for first five days. But the fifth day was literally a realization that, oh, it's likely I'm, I'm never going to go back and live with my family ever. So I, I think that was quite a heartbreaking realization. And uh, I quite kind of knew very soon that, you know, I love living here and love working here. Um, so the, the experience was oh, enormous opportunity meeting so many different people from all around the world and connecting with people who I didn't even knew, know they existed, like countries I hadn't heard about. So I'm really, like, really, really happy I had the chance to explore Europe. Um, well, how did you find London? Well, London is overwhelming, <laughs> very, very overwhelming, um, it's so surprising that I can travel for an hour and a half and still not not get to the other side. <laughs> so I'm still getting used to it because I arrived in London six weeks before the pandemic long lockdown. Yeah. So I have I have not explored London yet. So any any tips? Any tips you have be for me? I will I will give your you because I had my placement right before it, pandemic hit. So I did. Um, I did talk about that, but um, that is for offline because we're here to hear about you and um, other things. And so tell us a little bit about what you do that is not work. What do you do around London? Well, this is funny. The thing that I do not do is work is actually another work. <laughs> I don't know if I can talk about it. Um, I, have, I have another project called Open Life Science. It's a training and mentoring program in open science that I run with a wonderful group of ladies. Um, and, uh, that's, that takes up a lot of my time beyond work, but I do like to paint. Um, the new thing that I have learned during the lockdown is acrylic painting. Oh, that's really, so cool. Yeah. I really, I really recommend, um, abstract painting. The reason I started to do abstract painting is because we moved to a new house and we went to buy paintings and they are so expensive. And every time I saw a painting, I'm like, oh, I can't do that. <laughs> uh, so my partner bought me canvas and paint and it's like, do it then. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's been, that's been quite uh, pleasant. I read some books. I listen to podcasts. I love Radio Lab a lot. Um, 
yeah, and then sometimes hang out with friends now that we can. And it's, so uh, it's really great to see London. I love the fact, I think everyone can relate to looking at it. Oh, I can do this. You, <laughs> you actually, actually went, went around, around and did it. I did it, yeah. <laughs> Oh, cool. That's that's a, a good a good skill to have and a good thing to know. Um, how are you how are you finding uh, balancing? I guess both works that you have, and um, and like personal life. Yeah, I I think I have to admit, if you're doing side gig, um, it it kind of seeps into your personal life. And I read it somewhere that do something that you're passionate about and you'll not work a single day of your life. And they were such a liar <laughs> uh, because no, yeah, for sure. And I, I'm not just saying for myself, I'm, I, I know a lot of people um, do a lot of side work, nonprofit work, volunteer work, and it's deeply meaningful and important for us. The work that I do, I know um so it's a training and mentoring program, meaning that people actually get mentored by experts. And I see a huge value of that. Um, however, yeah, I need to learn how to how to actually carve out, carve out more time for myself. Um, but I'm glad that that it's working so far. Yes, um, we're glad to have you here and to have you uh, do all of this work. Um, how do you find um, coming to the Turing and working with the Turing? And uh, being part of the community here, being part of ASG. Yeah. Um, so it was, ASG was a mystery. It's such a huge program. Um, but the, the more I learned about ASG, I was so in awe of all the research that's happening, the kind of collaboration that's happening, that, that you you get to be part of projects that have actual societal impact. So it's been it's been fantastic. People that I work with, they have always something new to teach. Just because they're talking, I, I learn so much. Um, I am really uh, privileged that ASG invested in the work that I do. So they, they invested a lot in community management. We could set up now a community management team. These community managers are integrated in different parts of research in the Turing beyond ASG and, uh, I think ASG is going to leave legacy through the work uh, that they have done beyond their time. And what is um, what do you see happening beyond um, ASG? I think people have built really strong relationship in ASG, um, not just like because they were working in a project, but they also really got to translate the project that they were working on in different contexts. Um, and those relationships will go on. I would give a shout out to Aida Mehonech and her team, research application managers who have done fantastic work uh, translating software and data from one program into another or, you know, deploying it in the local council. And I think these examples will really help new programs and new research projects to build on best practices. So ASG um, definitely has exemplified open source strong collaboration, interdisciplinarity, and uh, trusting in open leadership. This is such a good um, perspective. Uh, will you will you continue at the Turing post-ASG? <laughs> well, yeah, luckily tools, practices, and systems will continue beyond ASG, incubated from ASG, of course, um, but the research application management and community management team will uh, continue on and in the Turing next version. We have yet to hire a lot of new members. The Turing Way will have a practitioner hub where we will hire more people. Um, so yeah, I I do hope that there is um, a lot more exciting things coming next year's. So there you have it, everyone. There's an inside scoop of uh, <laughs> what's coming after ASG. Thank you, Malvika, so much. It's been a lovely chat and it's been lovely to just sit down and have a hot beverage and <laughs> talk and get to know you a little better. Is there anything else you would like to tell our listeners? Oh, thank you so much, Bri. I'm so delighted to sit here and talk to you. And um, I would just say to the listeners, if you want to get in touch with me, please do. Um <laughs> I will share my email with B. <laughs> yes, definitely. We will share when the episode comes out. So thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you for listening to The Coffee Pod. I'm your host, B. Costa Gomes, and the episodes are produced by Luca Lane. 
This is a collaboration with ASG, with a shout out to Zainab Ismail and Achintia Rao. Our music has been produced by Spiders Eat Vinyl.